Okay, let's start. Um, we started in the last class <clears throat> with the ligand field theory in the first example um, of our application of ligand field theory to a practical example was to apply ligand field theory to an octahedral complex. So going through the first two steps, we have determined the, the point group and we have determined the coordinate um, system. We have also determined the frontier orbitals and the symmetry types of the frontier orbitals. So <clears throat> next we looked at the ligand and we chose a carbon ligand as an example ligand and we have constructed the molecular orbital diagram of our um, ligand and we found that This orbital here, the 3A1 orbital, is the highest occupied molecular orbital that we would use for a sigma bond. Now, the CO uh, molecule is a little bit uh, an unusual molecule because its dipole moment is actually slightly pointing toward the carbon, not the oxygen. And that actually has to do with the nature of this highest occupied molecular orbitals. Uh, somewhat um, interbonding molecular orbital, and for that reason, the electron density of that uh, molecular orbital is uh, located primarily at, at the carbon. And the effect is actually big enough so that even though the oxygen is the more electronegative atom, the um, molecule is overall slightly polarized toward the um, carbon. All right, um, it is um, also worthwhile to compare the molecular orbital picture again with the valence bond picture and we see um, this here. So we have um, in the simple valence bond picture, these three um, bonds here between carbon and oxygen, one sigma bond and two into pi bond, into pi bonds, and we have two electron lone pairs. So that should give in the molecular orbital picture basically three molecular orbitals which are bonding and which are filled. And we should also have two non-bonding or at least approximately non-bonding um, molecular orbitals as well. Now, when you look for these, then you can assign this one uh, a one molecular orbital. Um, to be well, the sigma bond, so to say, in the valence bond picture. And the two pi bonds are represented by these two bonding molecular orbitals with E1 symmetry. They are primarily, however, not only composed of the Px and the Py orbitals that stand perpendicular to the bond axis and overlap in the in a <clears throat> in a pipe in pipe fashion. Well, to be precise, they're actually only made of these um, atomic orbits. So only of the Px and the Py, they don't have any other uh, influence. Um, so last but not least, we have these two electron lone pairs to explain. And um, we can assign these two electron lone pairs to the 2A1 and the 3A1 molecular orbitals. So these are both, well, approximately non bonding. So this one here, I said, is actually uh, somewhat inter bonding and it has therefore, it's therefore polarized toward the carbon. And for similar reason, this one here um, is, is actually also slightly inter bonding, it's actually also uh, slightly polarized toward the carbon. So this is actually another argument as to why the dipole moment of this, this molecule is polarized slightly towards the carbon. And here you see actually quantitatively that um, the dipole moment is polarized by 0.1 by toward the carbon. All right. So now we have uh, um, brought the valence bond picture also in accordance with the molecular uh, orbital of the picture. 
Okay. Um, now let us apply our knowledge to the construction of um, uh, molecular orbits. So our next step is to determine the symmetry types of these highest occupied molecular orbits that are suitable for sigma bonding. And we apply the usual two steps. We first determine the reducible representation for the respective orbits. These are the, the homos. And then we determine the symmetry types of the irreducible representations using the reduct, uh, <coughs> reduction formula. So now we have to be clear um, how many um, of the ligand group orbitals we would expect. So we say that we use one homo per ligand. So overall, we have six homos because we have six ligands. That is due to the fact that we have an octahedral complex. So for that reason, if we combine six of these highest molecular highest occupied molecular orbitals, we would expect six ligand group orbitals, and we need to determine the, the reducible representation and the irreducible representation for, for those. So I'm not going through the entire mathematics of that again. Again, we could determine the symmetry types by applying the orbital swapping method and, other, and after that, the reduction formula. If you feel you need more practice with this, you can again, as a, as a little homework, go through the, these steps explicitly, since there's nothing really new to learn, though I will skip these explicit steps and only present you the result of the procedure. So result is that we'll have one ligand group over with A1G symmetry. In addition to that, we have two BG orbitals, which are doubly degenerate. And furthermore, we have three orbitals with T2U symmetry. So these are overall the six ligand group orbitals we are looking for, okay? Three plus two plus one is six. And we know now their symmetry types. So if we analyze these ligand group in more detail, which do not, need do not need to do necessarily, that one can compute those, then we would find that the A1G orbitals has no node. The T1U uh, orbitals have one node and the EG orbitals have two node, but that's actually not necessary to know in order to construct the molecular orbital uh, diagram. All right, so now let's construct our molecular orbital diagram. So we do what we always do. We first plot the atomic orbitals and the ligand group orbitals respectively, plot the symmetry types, and then we determine the uh, molecular orbitals. So for the metal orbitals, we previously determined that our frontier orbitals are 3D, the 4S, and the 4P. So on the right-hand side, we have the six living group orbitals. Okay, we can plot them energetically all on one line, even though they have a different number of nodes. So it would be even more precise if we plotted the energy according to the number of nodes, but the energy difference is naturally equal anyways, and these little group orbitals are just artificially, artificial construction. Of course, they do not uh, occur in nature. They are just artificial mathematical intermediates. Therefore, it's okay if we plot them actually all in one line. All right, so we determined previously that for the 3D orbitals, we have EG and T2G symmetry, respectively. The 4S orbital has A1G symmetry, and the 4P orbital has T T1U symmetry. So for the ligand group orbitals, we just determined that one has A1G symmetry, one has EG symmetry, and one has T2, T, T1U symmetry. So what we need to do again now is combine orbitals of the same symmetry type to form molecular orbitals. The number of molecular orbitals must be the same as the number of atomic orbitals. So with which symmetry type we start is arbitrary. So we can, for instance, start with the symmetry type A1G. So we realize that 
the fourth orbital has A1G symmetry, and one of the six ligand group orbitals also does have A1G symmetry. So what would we expect from that? Well, we would expect two molecular orbitals, one bonding and one interbonding. The bonding has lower energy. The interbonding one has higher energy. We would label the one with the lower energy A, one A, one G, and the one with the higher energy would label two A, one G. Okay. So we would again uh, uh, connect the molecular orbitals with the orbitals from which they have been constructed from using dotted lines. Okay. See this here. Okay. Okay, now we can go to the next symmetry type. So for instance, we can choose the next symmetry type to be the symmetry type EG. So we realize that two of the metal D orbitals have EG symmetry, and also two of our ligand group orbitals have EG symmetry. So that means that we get one double degenerate pair of bonding molecular orbitals that have EG symmetry and another pair of um, interbonding molecular orbitals also having EG symmetry. So the bonding molecular orbitals must have low energy. The um, interbonding molecular orbitals must have high energy. Um, pairs of orbitals which are uh, double degenerate um, must have the same energy. So they have to be plotted. So, yeah. So you see here, the bonding one, and here, the interbonding ones, these are the 1 EG and these are the 2 EG. So again, we connect orbitals of the same type with dotted lines um, so that we know which orbitals have been constructed from which um, atomic orbitals. All right, so now what's left is the um, T1 U, T1 U symmetry type, we see that the four P orbitals have T1 U symmetry and the remaining three ligand group orbitals also have T1 U symmetry. So that gives three tri triply degenerate bonding molecular orbitals and three triply degenerate interbonding molecular orbitals. So the bonding ones are high in energy, uh, the bonding ones are low in energy, the interbonding ones are I in energy. Okay, again, we uh, connect the molecular orbitals of that symmetry type with the atomic orbitals of the ligand group orbitals of the same symmetry type using dotted lines in order to indicate from which orbitals they have been made from. Okay, so again, we cannot, um, with our qualitative considerations, um, determine the relative energies of all orbitals quantitatively. So, for instance, we would not know for sure that our 1A1G is lower in energy than the T1U, and these are lower in energy than the E. 1EG could also be the other way around. Without quantitative considerations, one would not know that. Therefore, these um, orbitals could be also drawn differently in energy, and that wouldn't count as a mistake because there's this level of uncertainty in the construction of qualitative molecular orbital diagrams. Okay, um, now what's left is the T2G orbitals here. Three D orbitals have T2G symmetry. And now we see that these orbitals, they do not find partners because there are no ligand group orbitals that have the same symmetry. So those who have to draw as non-bonding orbits into your molecular orbital diagram. That means that they have to have exactly the same energy as the metal D orbits, okay? So again, you connect the T2G orbitals in the molecular orbital diagram with the T2G orbitals, which are metal D orbitals using dotted lines in order to indicate that these molecular orbitals have been made from the metal uh, T2G orbitals. Okay, so um, now 
we still have to fill in the electrons. Okay. So now we view our our bonds as donor acceptor bonds. Okay. So we say that our single bonds that we are making um, results from the donation of living electrons into the metal orbitals. Okay. So our highest occupied molecular orbitals are being filled with two electrons and these electrons are getting donated into the transition metal uh, orbitals. So now we have overall six formals to consider that contain two electrons each. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Sorry. So for example, two T1U can be lower in energy than two, two EG. Um, well, that, that is actually not uh, really possible. Yeah, for this for the simple for the simple reason that these T2G must be exactly non-bonding. Okay, and we know that the 2EG must be interbonding. Okay, and they have been made from 3D orbitals as well. Therefore, these T2G cannot be lower in energy than the 2EG. It must be drawn. So in this case, there's no ambiguity. Yeah. So you always have to be very careful when an ambiguity really arises and when not. And when it's, and when it's not arising, then you have to draw the relative order correctly. Yeah. And you'll see that it's very important that um, these two EG orders are energetically higher than the T2G orbitals because they are actually the frontier molecular orbitals. I'm going to explain this in a moment. But it's a good uh, point, point to raise. Um, so we do, not, we do know that the two EG are higher than the T2G, OK? Okay, now back to the number of electrons. So overall, we must have 12 electrons in the homos, and therefore we must draw 12 electrons into the living group orbits. Okay, so now we create our donor acceptor bonds, and that means that we fill these 12 electrons into our molecular orbits according to energy. So that means that forward again. We fill this one A one G. Then we fill the one T one U. Now we have spent eight electrons. So after we are filling the one E G, we have spent ten electrons. No, we have already spent 12. Yeah. Um, so two and these six are eight, and these are 10 and then are 12. So we have already spent 12 electrons. Okay. So now that means that if the metal had any electrons in addition, which would be in the 3D orbits, they would need to go into the T2G or 2EG orbits depending on how many G electrons our metal would have. And that makes the T2G and the 2EG orbits our metal frontier orbits. Okay, we can say in a way that these are the, are the uh, metal D orbits that split in energy in an octahedral ligand field. And here we have an analogy between the crystal field theory and the ligand field theory. In the crystal field theory, we say, well, our metal D orbital split in energy in an octahedral crystal field. Here we see that we're actually creating molecular orbitals, um, which are similar 
to d orbitals, and for that reason, you can say that these d orbitals are splitting with energy in an uh, octahedral ligand field. So these t to g orbitals here, they are even exactly metal d orbitals because these are the non-bonding metal d orbitals. But even those ones here, here, these interbonding ones, uh, have relatively similar nature to the metal d orbitals from which they have been made. Okay because they have been constructed from the um, metal EG D orbitals, not only so, <clears throat> but significantly so. And um, the energy of these EG orbitals is relatively similar to the metal DEG orbitals. Okay, so therefore we can say that these EG orbitals here, still resemble metal d orbitals in the in, under the influence of this octahedral ligand field okay okay therefore we can again say that the energy difference between t to g and e g is again some kind of delta o All right, so now we have, however, only considered sigma bonding thus far. Now next, according to our protocol that we have developed, we also have to think about pi bonding. So now we have to go back to the molecular orbital diagram of our ligand and see if there are also molecular orbitals present that have suitable symmetry and also energy to overlap with metal d orbitals in a pi fashion. Okay, now when we do so, we realize that below the HOMO, not too far below in energy, we have these uh, one e orbitals, which represent our pi bonding pi electrons, and not too far above our HOMO, we have the interbonding 2E uh, orbitals, which represent our LUMOS, in which, are, which are basically our interbonding pi star molecular orbitals. Now, when we analyze their symmetry, we realize that they have suitable symmetry to overlap with metal B orbitals in a pi fashion, therefore, we can use them in order to construct additional molecular orbital that would now represent the pi bonding within the complex. Okay. So now we have to consider two pi and two pi star orbitals for each ligand. So that gives four orbitals per ligand. Remember, we have six ligands because we have an octahedral complex, and therefore, have overall six times four gives 24 orbitals to consider. Okay, 12 of these orbitals will be pi orbitals, and another 12 will be pi star orbitals. So, we would expect overall 24 ligand group orbitals. So, 12 of them will be. Uh, made from the bonding pi molecular orbitals, and another 12 will be made from the interbonding pi star molecular orbitals. Okay. okay. Um, so now here um, is illustrated how these pi orbitals overlap with the metal D orbitals in pi fashion. So we have here our uh, uh, metal carbon bonds between the metal and the carbon ligand. We define the CO axis um, as the bond axis. So our coordinate system is set up so that the Z axis here points to the right. And we can define that the X axis points upward and then the Y axis would point toward us. So now that defines how our orbitals are being oriented. Yeah, because we've chosen our coordinate coordinate system in a particular way. Okay, so now we can say 
where we have a bonding phi molecular orbital, which is um, which is uh, here in this in this xc xc plane. And well, this one could overlap with our uh, with a dxc molecular orbital in a pi fashion. Okay, you can see that there's pi orbital overlap between these two lobes of our dxc and that pi star, uh, sorry, pi molecular orbital of the carbonyl ligand. Okay, so this is just an illustration that there's really pi overlap present. All right, then the same can also be arranged for the pi star molecular orbital. So the pi star molecular orbital has a, a node in between the carbon and the oxygen, but the lobes are also oriented so that we can create orbital overlap with a metal D orbital. So you see that also for this one, um, we can create pi orbital overlap with the DXC molecular orbital. You see that this lobe overlaps with this lobe here in pi fashion, and that this lobe here overlaps, overlaps with this lobe of the pi star molecular orbital in pi fashion. Okay, now we have also our second pi bond. So we have uh, <clears throat> bonding pi molecular orbital that basically stands perpendicular to this one. Okay, so <clears throat> this is shown here. So I just, we have redefined the axis. So Z still points to the right, but now Y points to the, to the top, okay. And now, therefore, we have our pi molecular orbital, which is the well, yz plane. And now this molecular orbital can overlap with the dyz in a pi fashion. You can see this. When you analyze the orbital overlap between this lobe and this lobe here, and this lobe and this lobe over there. OK, so the same is certainly also true for the pi star molecular orbital. So the respective pi star molecular orbital can also overlap with the metal dyz orbital in a pi fashion. We can again verify this by analyzing the overlap between this lobe here and this lobe over there, and this lobe here, and this lobe of the pi star orbital over there. All right. So um, now, we have, of course, five other ligands. Uh, one also approaching from the z-axis, and the, and the other four approaching from the x and y-axis. Okay, but they can overlap um, in an analogous way with uh, with the metal dxc, the dxy, and the dxy in a, in a pi fashion. Right? I think that's. Only the direction of approach is actually changing. Okay, um, now we have confirmed that we can really make pi bonding with our 24 um, pi molecular orbitals. We now again have to determine the symmetry types of these, of the ligand group orbitals that result from the combination of these 24. Okay. Now we have two groups. Yeah, we have the, the bonding pi orbitals and the interbonding pi star orbitals. And we can analyze, we can analyze them separately. Okay. Um, and as we do so, we notice that the 12 bonding pi orbitals can be grouped into T1G and T2G and T1G and T2U group orbitals, okay? That again can be determined using the orbital swapping method and the um, reduction formula. I'm not doing this explicitly here again for, for clarity and time reason, but you can easily see that that gives overall 
12 organs, right? Three plus three plus three plus three, that is 12. Okay? Three living group organs have T1 G symmetry, three have T, two G symmetry, three have T1 U symmetry, and the last three have T2 U symmetry. So we can do the same also for the interbonding pi organs, and the result would be the same. So um, three of the 12 living group organs that we, that we would expect have T1 G symmetry, um, three have T2 G symmetry, three have T1 U symmetry, and the last three have T2 U symmetry. Okay, so now we have determined the symmetry types of our ligand group orbits. So next, we have to determine, well, how many molecular orbitals will that give an addition? And what are their what are their symmetry types? Okay, but before before we go to that, I just want to mention that um, a pi orbital overlap cannot only be created by uh, ligands that have pi and pi star orbitals. However, um, some ligands just don't have that. Um, for instance, when we have a simple bromo ligand, then certain p orbitals that the bromo ligands have have also suitable symmetry in order to overlap in a, in a pi fashion. So you do not necessarily need a pi or pi star orbit in your leg. Okay, when you have a simple atom, also a p orbit may just have the correct symmetry. And when you have the relatively exotic case that you have complex with the metal metal bonds, and even two um, metal orbitals can overlap in a pi fashion. Okay, so for instance, if dxy can overlap with another dxy in a pi fashion, as shown here. Okay, but this is just a little excursion. Let's go back to our complex with the carbon ligand. And we indeed now have to identify the number of molecular orbits which we construct in the symmetry types. So we can go to the symmetry types step by step. Okay, so. Um, we previously determined that our metal orbitals in octahedral ligand field are have EG symmetry type and T2G symmetry type. Okay, for simplification reasons, we now only evaluate the interactions of the ligand group orbitals that we have created with metal D orbitals and not with the other orbitals. So this is somewhat of a uh, simplification, but it's a use for simplification. Otherwise, the uh, molecular orbit type gets even more complex as it already will turn out with this simplification. So now for our ligand group orbits, we have the T2G, the T1U, the uh, T1G, and the T2U. Okay, so now what can we combine? So as you can see, we can combine uh, the T2G, of which we have three available, with these three T2G, and that gives six or moles, which would represent pi bonding. So what you see is that the EG orbitals, yeah, of the metal, they do not find a partner, so they are not involved in the pi bonding at all. That's not an important result that needs to be remembered. And in addition to that, you see that the T1U ligand group orbitals don't find a partner. If we consider only interactions with the metal D orbitals, <clears throat> the T1G also don't find a partner, and the T1, T2U also don't find a partner. Okay? So that makes our life relatively simple. Um, we only need to consider the T2G ligand group orbitals for bonding, and we can say that all the other ligand group orbitals just remain non bonding. All right, so now with this knowledge, we can modify our, uh, our molecular orbital diagram so that the effects of pi bonding are now included. All right, oh yeah, I forgot of course something. Um, now we have to 
consider the interborning orbitals of course as well. Yeah. So there's also a set of interborning orbitals which has two T to G symmetry. Okay, remember what previously. So now because of that, we have actually overall nine molecular orbitals of T to G symmetry. Okay. Um, these three, these three, and these three give together nine. Okay, uh, with regards to the others, again, there's nothing to consider because they don't find a bonding problem. Yeah, but these two we have to consider in, in addition. All right, so um, now we can distinguish between two extreme cases, okay? Um, the first case is that our bonding T2G orbitals are energetically much closer to the metal T2G orbitals than the interbonding T2G star orbitals, yeah? So we can say in approximation, we will neglect the influence of our interbonding C2G orbitals. Okay? So we just say, well, these remain approximately non-bonding, even though not exactly so. Uh, but we construct additional fine molecular orbitals only from these bonding C2G and the metal T2G. Okay, so as we do so, we create a set of bonding molecular orbitals that have T2G symmetry and a set of interbonding molecular orbitals that have T2G representing our pi bonds. So now, um, what will happen to the electrons? Well, these bonding T2G are full of electrons. Yeah, so you we. We can fill these electrons into the bonding T2G orbitals that have been created. And you see that in this case, we are actually stabilizing the um, energy of these ligand electrons by creating these pi bonds. Okay. On the other hand, it means that if we have metal D orbitals available, okay, then we would destabilize. Um, these, yeah, because they have, would have to go into the interbonding molecule. Okay, now depending on how many d orbitals we have, we can have either a net stabilization of the electrons overall or not. Okay, um, so generally we would be able to see from this picture that if you have relatively few um, D orbits in this case, um, that this would actually really stabilize our complex because we would have to have feel relatively few of these electrons in the interbonding T2T orbits. Okay, so now um, this case. Um, and all this scenario also has an influence on our delta O. So we previously said that our delta O is the energy between the T2G and the EG orbitals of the matter. Okay. So now, after consideration of pi bonding, the energy difference is determined by the energy of these interbonding T2G and these EG. So that means now that our delta O has uh, uh, decreased. Okay. So overall, we uh, call this kind of bonding situation a bonding situation due to um, a ligand that um, is a so called pi donor. Okay. Why is it a pi donor? Because Primarily, the bonding T2G ligand orbitals interact with the metal T2G orbitals. Okay, and therefore the ligand electrons 
in these T2G molecular authors are being partially transferred to the metal because these bonding T2G authors are uh, shared between the metal and the ligand. So in other words, before the, the metal ligand interaction, these electrons were exclusively located at the ligand, but now they have been donated in a donor acceptor interaction of being shared. That means that overall we have a partial electron transfer from the ligand to the metal. Okay? And that electron transfer occurs in a pi fashion. Therefore, we call uh, would call such a ligand uh, a pi donating ligand. All right. So when we have a pi donating ligand, then that means that this leads to a decrease of a delta O. Okay, now we can, so that is for instance, the case for a BR minus Ni, yeah? The BR minus Ni is a typical uh, high donor. So in many situations, uh, it's four P orbitals are uh, located in energy relatively close to metal T to G orbitals, basically um, any, non-filled orbitals, which would, could be p orbital in the next child would be energetic just far too high to have an influence. Um, so now let's go to the other case, the other extreme case. The other extreme case would be that <clears throat> the ligand T2G star orbitals would be energy, energetically much closer to the metal T2G orbitals in comparison to the bonding T to G orbitals. So in this case, we could neglect the effect of the bonding T to G orbitals to the bonding. We could approximate the bonding T to G orbitals as non-bonding. We consider the interactions between the T to G star and the metal T to G orbitals only. Okay. So now, Let's think that to the end. Um, you can write these um, T2G orbitals, which are bonding, as non bonding into our molecular orbital diagram. And well, this interaction between the T2G star and the T2G would again result into bonding T2G and enter bonding T2G. So now what you see is that in this kind of interaction, which is actually called a pi acceptor interaction, coming from a pi accepting ligand, there is no stabilization of the energy of the ligand electrons because they are assumed to be approximately non-bonding. However, there is now a stabilization of the um, metal D electrons. Okay. So now in this case, we all have a different effect on our delta O. Uh, again, our delta O is defined as the energy difference between T2G and EG. So before consideration of the pi um, effects, our delta E was this, yeah, and after that, it's now this, yeah, it's the difference between the bonding T to G orbitals and the EG orbitals. So, therefore, when we have uh, a so called pi accepting ligand, and CO is actually a typical example for that, then that leads to an increase of a delta. So, that's also an important result that you need to remember. So now, why do we call this kind of ligand uh, a pi acceptor? That is because there's partial electron transfer from the metal to the ligand. So we say previously that basically nothing happens to the electrons in the T to T pi orbits of the ligand. So therefore they just remain at the ligand. 
But any electrons that are the metal T2G electrons, they are now being shared between the metal and the ligand. Okay, so there was partial electron transfer from the metal to the ligand, therefore we call such a ligand a pi acceptor. So now we have to consider that these two cases are of course only extreme cases. You can everything, have everything in between also, okay? Not necessarily um, one of the two T2G orbitals is energetically so far away so that the its influence can be can be neglected. So basically, you can have everything in between a uh, strongly pi strong pi donor to a weak pi donor uh, to having no pi effects at all when they're actually canceling out to a weak pi acceptor to pi acceptor. Okay, and now you see that from that that. The ligand field theory can explain something the Kuster field theory could not. So the Kuster field theory could not explain why certain ligands create actually different delta O's. But you see that the ligand field theory can through the nature of the pi bonding effects within the complex. When you have a pi donor, the delta O gets small, producing a smaller field. And when we have a strong acceptor, um, that all gets larger and we have a large uh, ligand field, so to say. Okay, now as a last step, let us uh, uh, work what we have to, um, the pi bond effects into our overall molecular orbital diagram. Okay, and let's do this for the example of the um, a pi, except the interaction. So that would be, for instance, the case in the chromium hexacarbonyl, where a chromium is surrounded by six CO ligands, which would interact as a pi, pi acceptor, as pi acceptor ligands. Okay, so here's again the molecular orbital diagram without the pi interactions. So now how do we need to modify to account for the pi interactions? Well, we would only need to consider the interbonding T2G orbitals, ligand group orbitals of the ligand. Okay, the bonding we neglect because we know our CO is a pi acceptor. And those ligand group orbitals that have other symmetry, we also neglect because we know that they don't interact with the metal EG and K2G orbitals. Okay, so now, what does that mean? I have three additional T2G orbits to consider. That means that I have to create three additional T2G metal orbits. Okay. Uh, so molecular orbits, not metal orbits. So now initially we have determined that these three T2G metal orbits just remain non-bonding. Now as they interact with these T2G star, well, what happens is that these go down in energy, okay? Oops. Yeah, these go down in energy and we create, must create, of course, also uh, a second pair of T2G orbitals, which is antibody, okay? So now again, our, uh, the number of Molecular orbital T2G is the same as the number of atomic orbitals T2G. Okay, so now our formerly non bonding um, molecular T2G molecular orbitals have been become bonding, and that has le led to an increase of our delta O. Okay, now under these considerations, also, we can explain why the 18 electron rule holds for this complex if you counted the electrons. Well, there would be these, these 12 electrons coming from the ligand, and there would be the six electrons coming from the metal. If we did apply our electron counting um, using the neutral atom method, and that would give overall 18 electrons. Okay, 
Inch. Now, when we look into the molecular orbital diagram, we see that there are exactly now 18 electrons in bonding molecular orbits. We do not have to fill any non bonding molecular orbits or any inter bonding molecular orbits. And that's, of course, always ideal for the stability of a complex. And so we see that in, in, in this way, the molecular orbital theory explains why 18 electrons for this complex is just the best. And we analyze the molecular orbital diagrams for many complexes, we would, the molecular orbital always confirm, in many cases confirm that when we have 18 electrons, our bonding molecular orbitals are completely full and, and our interbonding molecular orbitals are completely empty, which explains the stability. So you see that in this way, um, uh, our molecular orbital theory, it's ligand field theory, is, is uh, again able to explain something that the crystal field theory could not, could not do, crystal field theory could not explain the ATM. Okay, um, then we can also maybe, I may just finish this up briefly, uh, explain also the opposite case when we have a pi donating ligand. So for instance, uh, uh, tungsten hexachloride has six chloro ligands. Um, and but the tungsten is a group six element which doesn't have any electrons left because it's in the oxidation state plus six. Okay, so now if we consider the pi bonding interaction field, we now consider the chloro ligand as a typical pi donating ligand. Yeah, a lot of night ligands are typical pi donating ligands. So in this case, we'd need to consider the bonding T to G pi orbits. All right, so now the effect of this is that we would, would create here bonding T to G orbitals, and these formerly non-bonding T to G orbitals would become interbonding, and that would lead to a decrease of a, of a uh, delta orbital. Now again, we can count the number of electrons, and you would find that um, in the tra traditional counting method, our 18 electron rule would be violated. Yeah, because it we would only count the 12 electrons from the ligand here, because in our electron counting method, we only account for the sigma bonding usually. We would, we would portray the tungsten chloride bonds as, as single bonds, and therefore we would not see any pi interactions. Yeah. Um, but if we take the pi interactions into account, actually, then we would add additional six electrons, and that would then again give 18 electrons. So that means that if we accounted for the pi interactions also, the 18 electron rule also in this case wouldn't even be violated. But if we only counted the sigma bonds, we would explain, also we would understand now why the 18 electron rule is being violated. Okay, because again, um, we have enough electrons to only fill our bonding molecular orbits and not fill our anti-bonding molecular orbits, and that just results in the most stable bonding situation for the molecule. All right, then let's stop at this point. Slightly over the time today. <laughs>